get rid of this mask. Okay. Uh, good morning, my brothers and sisters in Christ. We're going to start our devotional service. So, so happened this morning I woke up with a song on my heart. And, I was, uh, and it was, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. And I came in here and I picked up the hymn book and turned to it. And as I was doing that, lo and behold, our, uh, what, impressionist back there had the same thing in mind. He printed it on for me. I think that was by Mahela Jackson, wasn't it? That particular one. It sounded like her voice. It sounded good. Well, hey, just because he played it, what a friend we have in Jesus, that don't mean we can't sing it also. So we're going to sing by him, start with uh, our hymn 340, and there's some books if you have it. If not, you should know the words just by listening to the song. Okay, and my book is 340. I can't sing it as well as they did. I'll try my best. What a, what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and grief to bear. What a privilege to carry. Everything to God in prayer. <clears throat> oh, a peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pains we bear. Oh, because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful? Who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Praise God. I'm going to let it go at that. I just had a, a symphony and everything. Thank you, Lord. Let us have prayer. Father God, in the precious name of Jesus, Lord God, it's another Sunday that you allowed us to see. We come here this morning, no form or fashion, just to give homage unto you and to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who made that ultimate sacrifice for giving his life for us. So we just thank you, Holy Father. And so we, lay put, we put this service in your hands today. So we ask you to have your way with us. Just let us come on one accord and just think about all the wonderful things that we have, that we have been through. That, and the things that we have been through and the wonderful way that we have came out of it. We're still suffering with some disease they call a uh, coronavirus and some people are still skeptical about it. But someone out there know what the problem is. And we just thank you for that you 
have touched us in a way that we can now look behind us and see that there is a cure for it. So many of us have lost our lives. I think the last count that I remember that they were talking about is over half a million people had lost their life for, for a disease that we had no control over and didn't know anything about. But now we can take off the mask. We can face it head on. So we just thank you for the people that had the diligence to lead it, stand up and go over it and find a cure for it. People are still skeptical because they said that you don't find a cure that, that, that soon. It, said it takes years and years of stuff and so forth. But we know that with you, Holy Father, anything is possible. You can do it in the, in, the, in the sight of a moment. But it was a lesson for us that we had to come closer together. We were tearing each other apart, breaking away from each other, everybody going their own which ways and everything. But this disease brought us all on one accord. We got together. We found the cure for it. We could do other things. That shows what man can do when we work together and what we believe in the Holy Father. So we just come here this, way, uh, this morning in no form of fashion just to give you thanks and praise that we can now go out and meet one another. We could take the mask off. We could do what we have to do to come together. Families are coming back together. So families that haven't seen each other in over two years are now starting to come back together because they've found out that this virus is controllable. We know with you, you could wipe it out in a moment. But it's a lesson that we must learn to learn how to come closer and work with one another. And that's what it takes. So we just thank you for how everything is just falling into place. So we come this morning in no form of fashion. We ask you to continue on touching us in a way that we can just come and mingle with one another and find that we all have one thing in common, that we are under your watch. So we just thank you for that. And as we go through this morning, we uh, ask you to watch over each and every one of us, watch over our families that are with us and not with us. And as we come together this Sunday morning, we ask you to just continue to just continue to uh, stay with us. So the things that we may go through, that we know that with you, it's all possible that we can control it and we can conquer it. So this morning we dedicate our lives once again to you for what you're doing in our lives. So we continually give you all the praise, all the honor. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to sing him number 248. That's been on my heart too today. Hold to God's unchanging hands. 248. Time is filled with truth transition. No on earth a move can stand. Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hands. You ought to hold to his hands, to God's unchanging hands. Just hold to his hands, to God's unchanging hands. Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hands. Trust in him who will not leave you. Whatsoever years may bring. If by earthly friends forsaken, still more closely to him cling. You just hold to his hand, to God's unchanging hand. 
you just hold to his hand. God's unchanging hands build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hands. Trust in him who will not leave you. Whatsoever years may bring, if by earthly friends forsaken, still more closely to him cling. You just hold to his hand, to God's unchanging hand. You just hold to his hand. To God's unchanging hand, build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hands. Cover not this world vain riches that so rapidly decay. Seek to gain the heavenly treasures. They will never pass away. You just hold to his hand, to God's son changing hand. Hold to his hand, to God's son changing hand. Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hands. When your journey is completed, if to God you have been true, Fair and bright the home in glory. Your enraptured soul with you. You hold to his hands, to God's unchanging hands. Just hold to his hand, to God's unchanging hand. Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hands. You just hold to his hand. To God's unchanging hand. You just hold to his hand. To God's unchanging hand. Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hands. Praise God. Praise God. Our scripture this morning will be coming from the Psalms. I don't want you ladies to feel uh, bad today, but I always like Psalms 1. Psalms 1. That's one of the first ones that when I started going to church, I started reading. I have a hand on it, but I just can't get to it. Maybe it's not meant for me. Okay, praise God, praise God. And it reads as thus. Maybe that's why I like it so much. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor sit of, or sit in the counsel of the uh, wicked, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scornfuls. But his delight is in the law of the, is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by the streams of water that yield its fruit in its seasons, and it is, and its leaf does not wither in all that he does. He prospers. The wicked are not so, but like the chaff that the wind driveth away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in his judgment, nor sinners in the 
nor sinners in the congregation that are righteous. For the Lord know the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Praise God. And as I said, it should be reading as uh, just a song. It was one of the first ones that I long, uh, that I read and enjoyed and everything. So praise God. We thank you for that. I see that our pulpit haven't came, so we'll just sing another song. 298. 298. That's one of my favorites. I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. And then a little light from heaven filled my soul. It bathed my heart in love. And he wrote my name above. And just a little talk with Jesus makes me whole. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus. You can tell him all about our troubles. He will hear our faintest cry. And he will answer by and by. Now you feel a little prayer we're turning, and you know a little fire's burning. I find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Sometimes my past seems dim without a ray of chill. And then a cloud of doubt may hide the light of day. The mist of sin may rise and hide the starry skies, but just a little talk with Jesus clears the way. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus. You can tell him all about our troubles. He will hear our faintest cry, and he'll answer by and by. Now you feel a little prayer we're turning, and you know a little fire's burning. I find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. I may have doubts and fears, my eyes be filled with tears, but Jesus is a friend who watches day and night. I go to him in prayer, he knows my every care, and just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus, you can tell him all about our troubles, he will hear our faintest cry, and he'll answer by and by. Now you feel a little prayer we're turning, and you know a little fire's burning. I find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus. You can tell him all about our troubles. He will hear your faintest cry, and he'll answer by and by. Now you feel a little prayer we're turning, and you know a little fire burning. I find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Praise God. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for participating with me this morning in our devotional service. And we're going to turn it over to the hand of the pulpit. And I just ask you to stay in love today. Good morning, church, and good morning, live stream. Glad to have you with us this morning. Let us stand for our call to worship. Our call to worship this morning is from the 100th Psalm. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. And 
But the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. Let us recite our mission and vision statement together. To introduce, present to all people, Jesus Christ, through our empowering ministries, by equipping the membership through the effective teaching and preaching of the word to the glory of God. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for another day's journey. Thank you, Lord, for this day, this opportunity to praise you, to lift up the name of Jesus, and to say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you brought us through this week. Thank you, Lord, that you watched over us, not just us, but our family, Lord God. Thank you, Lord, that you have provided for our needs. And we stand before you this morning for no other reason than to lift up the name of Jesus, to praise and glorify your name, to say thank you, and just to acknowledge that every good and every perfect gift comes from your hand. Thank you, Lord. We can't say it enough, Lord God. We love you today. We love you today. We love you, Lord, because you first loved us and cared for us. We thank you, Lord. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you would come into this service today. We pray, dear God, that you would have your way. We pray, Lord, that you would just touch our pastor, strengthen him, Lord, that he might bring forth the word in power. We ask, Lord, that you continually have your way in our lives, that we would be all that you would have us to be. Thank you, Lord. We offer this prayer in Jesus' name. We give you all praise, glory, and honor. Amen. Amen. Our morning hymn today, I believe, is Standing on the Promises. Hopefully it will be up on the screen. Ah, yes. And I will remind everyone that this is a congregational hymn. Standing on the promises of Christ, my King, through eternal ages let his praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing.
promises I cannot fall, listening every moment to the Spirit's call, resting in my Savior as my all in all, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing. Be seated. Good morning, church. Let me hear if there's actually someone this morning standing on the promises of God. Yes, things are going on all around us. Yeah, things are not getting any better, it seems like. We're, 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 we're buffeted by bad news on the right, bad news on the left. But what are we doing? We're looking up. Yeah, we're looking up from where our help comes. We're looking up for where the report is that we're going to listen to. Yes, standing on the promises. The Bible tells us after we've done all that we can do, what do we do? We stand. And it's important where we stand. Moses asked the question, who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. So we got to be standing in the right place. We got to be standing on Christ, the solid rock, because everything else is what? Sinking sand. Everything that man put in place can crumble and fall. But we will stand tall when we're standing for the Lord. Oh, praise his holy name. Our God is good. How many has he kept this past week? How many of our loved ones we can still embrace? Yes. How many of our loved ones can we still lift up in prayer? Yes. How many of us are still praying for this government of ours? Because they don't know what's going on. And we know that our God is not the author of confusion. Yes, he makes things plain and clear to us. We can turn on the news and we can say these two words. Thank God. Yes. Okay, we have a, just, just a couple announcements. Um, the CPR class that we're going to have is going to be on August 14th. If you have any questions, please see Sister Josephine McCormick or Sister Sherry Brown about the CPR class. And to remind you that Stop and Shop, when we go to Stop and Shop, we can buy these bags that say Give Back. Now, you got to make sure you buy the bags that say give back because I think they're $2 and they will give us back a dollar for our food pantry. Yes. So please remember those things. Pastor will have a little bit more to say about that and the uh, moving up ceremonies for our children. At this time... We're just going to come to the altar with our altar prayer. So let us bow our heads for those who cannot make it to our altar. Lord God, our dear Heavenly Father, we're praying, Lord God, 
for those who cannot make it to the altar this morning, be they live stream or here in the sanctuary. Lord God, we're just lifting up our brothers and our sisters. We're lifting up our sister Carol Duck, Lord God, in the passing of her sister. So we're lifting up the Duck family, Lord God. We're list, lifting up our sister Welfa Brothers, who is scheduled for surgery. So we're lifting her up and her family. We're lifting up, Lord God, because we just heard our own Deacon Tolliver is in the hospital. Lord, we're lifting him up to you because he'd rather be here in the sanctuary than where he is at this time. Lord God, we're lifting up all the emeritus members of our congregation. Lord, you know each of them by name. You know the labor that they put in. And your word it says, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, because your labor in Christ is not in vain. Father God, we're lifting up one another that's here in the sanctuary. We're lifting up those in the nursing home. We're lifting up those who are incarcerated, Lord God, those who are in the hospitals, Lord. God, we're lifting up those who don't know you in the pardon of their sins. Lord God, we pray have your way. Show yourself mighty. Show yourself strong. If we've ever needed you before, Lord God, oh, we sure do need you now. So, Father God, we lift up our loved ones. We lift up our family members. Lord, especially our unsaved family members. Lord God, because the time that we're going through is evil. We don't know what's around the next corner. But thank you. You do, Lord God. And you're the one that directs our path. So, Father God, as you receive the intercessory prayer from your only begotten son. Thank you, Lord God, for hearing our prayers for the loved ones. This we pray in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Good morning again. Our scripture reading this morning is coming from the book of John, the very first chapter. John 1, verses 14 and 15. And the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. John testified to him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. I've read to you John chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. The word of the Lord is blessed.
Oh, come on, let's give God a hand clap of praise in this place today. If God has been good to you, come on and give God some praise. God has been a provider, a healer, a keeper, a way maker. Come on and give God some praise. If God has strengthened you in your time of weakness, gave you hope in the midst of hopelessness, come on and give God some praise. Oh, I didn't say clap for the Yankees. I didn't say clap for the Mets. I said give God some praise. I was supreme being. I all in all. I will ever reach. Hallelujah! David declared, let everything that have breath do what? Praise. Praise the Lord. If you woke up this morning and you have breath in your body, the use and activities of your limbs, you should have waken up, you should have gotten up, even though it took a process, but you should have get, got out of your bed giving God some praise. Hallelujah. God watched over you last night while you slept and slumbered in your bed. God kept you from all hurt, harm, or danger. Kept fire and ambulance and police from your home. Hallelujah. God is keeping us. And we ought to give God the praise. Even in the midst of coming through this pandemic, God has kept us. And every single one of us has a story on how God has kept us. But most importantly, God gets the glory. I, I know they came up with a vaccine and all that, but we've already learned that the vaccine doesn't exempt you from getting it. So there's got to be some grace and mercy somewhere around there. Amen. To keep us and protect us. Amen. That we haven't been in the hospital. And even if we did go in the hospital, we're out of the hospital. Amen. We're at home and we're able to talk and raise our hands and put one foot in front of the other. If you got up this morning and you didn't need the help or assistance of a lift, you ought to give God some praise. If you could walk across the floor and didn't need a, a walker or a wheelchair, you ought to give God. Mm. Hallelujah. 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 I feel like I feel like Sister Ruth this morning. There ought to be some runners in the church. Amen. In the midst of all that's going on, God has been keeping us. Amen. And God did not allow some of this stuff to take us out of here. And so we ought to give God the glory, the honor, and the praise. Just before we get into the sermon this morning, last week we had the privilege of uh, honoring and recognizing our moving up children. And kids in the church and on Father's Day, we recognize our graduates and we're grateful to God for all of their accomplishments. But human error, we always miss somebody. Amen. And we've gotten some late submissions, but this is what we want to do. If there are other children out there that we have not received your information, we need you to send it in. We're going to do a final recognition on the fourth Sunday of this month. Amen. And we're going to get those late submissions and then others who have come in and we're going to do them all on the fourth Sunday. Is that all right? Amen. Instead of doing a couple a day and then somebody come in next Sunday and say, you forgot mine. Amen. So pass the word to your grandkids. Amen. To your children. Get those names into us here at the church office so that we can recognize those children because they need to be recognized. Amen. In the midst of this pandemic and their hard work, they need to be recognized. No matter how you feel about things that are going on, the kids need to be recognized. Amen. Amen, somebody. So please, ma'am, please, sir, get those in, and we will recognize them on the last Sunday in this month so that their accomplishments may be noted here in the body of faith. Because if the church is not recognizing them, amen. We want them to be in church. We've got to give them a reason to be in church. We need to recognize them, and we also need to allow them to participate in the ministry of the church. Amen. In September, we will be moving forward uh, to going back full time. We're grateful for all of you who have suffered through this pandemic uh, with the guidelines of the mask and the temperatures at the door. Amen. Uh, but we're looking forward to getting back to doing what God has called us to do. Uh, I know Sunday school is ready. Amen. And we'll be making provisions 
blessings uh, to have Sunday school in the house. Amen. Amen. BTU, we're already getting ready for our BTU classes and leadership in September. So you need to get ready. Amen. So that we can be in the house. I know people are still skeptical about what they're doing and I don't want to criticize anybody. Amen. But if you can go here, there and everywhere. You ought to be able to come to church and give God some glory. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, I, t I shared with you a few weeks ago that we were going to be doing this series on the summer on getting to know God, getting to know God. And we're going to continue that all summer. Our theme scripture uh, is a scripture from Hebrews, Hebrews chapter one. God in various times and various manners uh, revealed himself uh, unto the prophets and the children of God. But in these last days has revealed himself through his son, Jesus Christ. That is our theme scripture for the summer. Uh, but each Sunday, there will be a different scripture that we will use as our springboard or our platform for this moment of prophetic uh, preaching. This morning, uh, our scripture comes from the gospel according to St. John. Thank you, Minister Cornigans, for reading it. John chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. Very familiar passage to most of us. If not, it should be. Amen. It says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory. The glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That's verse 14. This morning, I want to talk to you from the subtopic, the illustrated version. The illustrated version. Gracious God, our Father, we thank you and we bless you for the moment that has been orchestrated and directed by your hand. We thank you, God, for your anointing upon each and every one of us. We're excited, Lord God, that even when we read your scripture, that not only was the anointing upon the prophets and the priests and the preachers, but the anointing was also upon the people. And we thank you, God, that not just the pulpit, but the pew gets the benefit of your glory. And God, we say thank you today that even in our homes, even in our cars, as we move back and forth over the highways and byways, it's your anointing that protects us and keeps us and sustains us in the midst of all that we do. Even, Lord God, when we make left turns, when we should have made right turns, your grace and your mercy still covers us. And for that, God, we say thank you. Thank you, oh God. This morning, as we look to the hills from which cometh our help, we open our hearts and our minds for a word from you that will be applicable in these last and evil days. That we can take the word, Lord God, that you transform it from the pages of the Holy Writ and write it in our hearts, Lord God, that like David, we will not sin against thee. Lord, whatever you have to do to me to get your word through me, do it even now. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And all the people of God said, Amen. Amen. In 1954, Henry Luce, the owner and creator of Time Magazine, created a special magazine called Sports Illustrated. This magazine was created to provide depth and clarity, but more importantly, a vivid pictorial view of major sports events. He hired some of the greatest photographers in the business to go to these major sporting events and take pictures action pictures of the events and the personnel while it was going on. And at the end of the month, they would take those pictures and put them in this magazine with some captions that listed the names and the events of the individuals. What this did as we were in the age of developing uh, television and media technology, we moved from radio to black and white TV into color TV, people now, Sister Jones, had pictorial or pictures, vivid pictures, color pictures of their favorite athletes or athletes in action. And it gave more meaning and more depth to these sporting events because people then had a visible, tangible record of the event that they could look on. And they also uh, Deacon Cornigans now had a historical record of these events that they could go back and visit. What a phenomenal idea to have this 
illustrated book, this, this book of illustrations of these sporting events. Well, that led me to a thought in my mind that as throughout history, according to Hebrews, God has been developing his word and releasing his word to various people and various cultures during various times in ways that they could understand it and receive it. Teach, Pastor, I know y'all will get with me in a moment. That when the word first came out in Genesis chapter number one, the word was spoken. The Bible says in the beginning was the word. Amen. God spoke everything into existence. It was in our vernacular verbal. We were able to hear it. And those things that were created heard the voice of God and came into existence because of God's voice. I wish I had some help in here. We move and God speaks and God continues to speak all the way up until the time of Moses. It is in the time of Moses when Moses goes up on Mount Sinai that we get another version of the word of God. And for the first time, beloved, it is in written form. So from Genesis to Moses on Mount Sinai, we had the verbal or the articulated word of God. But here in the book of Exodus or in the latter part of Exodus, we see God writing his word on stones or tablets, cutting them out of the rock and giving them to Moses. And Moses brings the word of God to the people of God. Now, I want to share with you just so that you understand that modern day English had not been created when God wrote. The word of God on the tablets. Uh, matter of fact, history teaches us that when God wrote the word in the tablets, it was written in the Hebrew language. Hello, somebody. It was not written in English. It wasn't written in, in, in Greek. It wasn't written, hello, somebody, uh, in English or the King James Version. It was written in the Hebrew language. Now, the Hebrew language is a whole lot different than our language of today. Amen. That's a whole nother lesson within itself. But God wrote the Ten Commandments or the commandments on these tablets, handed them to Moses. And Moses and the children of Israel, through their sojourn to the wilderness, even into the promised land and even through the judges and the kings, they maintained these tablets and what we now know was the Ark of the Covenant. And so the word of God was in the Ark of the Covenant, and the only people who had access or even could go in before the presence of the Ark was, was the high priest. Y'all need to help me in here. In other words, the people did not have access to the word. Let me say it one more time. The people did not have access, direct personal access to the word of God. It was the priest of God that came and presented uh, God and represented God before the people and also the people before God. It was the priest who knew God and knew what God's regulations were that communed those rules and regulations to the people. As Moses was leading the children of Israel, these individuals who had lived under uh, the Egyptian oppression for over 400 years and got their guidance and direction from the pharaohs were now in a position like when we were created where they could make some choices and decisions for themselves. Prior to this, they did not know how to interact with one another. They depended on the pharaohs and the leaders of Pharaoh to tell them what they were to do. But now that they have been freed by God and now they are coming into their own, Moses now served as their conflict manager. Yeah. Hello, somebody. Moses stood to help them settle their disputes and they used the law of God. They used the rules of God, the written rules of God, to manage their relationships one to another. I know we hear all of the time that great number of the thou shalt nots, what you shall not do. But there are some things in the Ten Commandments that you are to do. 
But I need to tell you that it wasn't just Ten Commandments that God gave unto the children of Israel. It wound up to be some 500 plus rules and regulations that God gave unto the children of Israel to one, govern how they were to worship God, how they were to interact with one another, rules about property and possession were all included in those 613 laws and regulations. But Moses had to stand in judgment and help the people manage their disputes. And all they had, y'all, was Moses' interpretation of the law. Fast forward a little bit, we moved from uh, the laws or the Pentateuch, which was written, the five, first five books of the Bible by Moses, and we move into a time where God says there will be godly individuals that I would instruct to give you enlightenment on my rules and regulations. They are called prophets. Hello, somebody. For every time period in the development of the children of Israel, from the judges to the kings and so forth in the Old Testament, there were appropriate prophets that served as the mouthpiece of God doing those specific times. I, I told Brother Smith, those of you who tuned in on the Sunday school, I love every time he gives the timeline of the Bible because it helps us to understand as the great philosopher for Ono says you cannot step in the same river twice. That when you step in it and step back out and step back in it, it's different. Amen. The Bible is living. It's continual. The word of God is continual. So every time we enter into the Bible, we're at a different place in the development and growth of the children of Israel. And watch this. You're even at a different place of growth and development every time you enter the word of God. For those of you who say, well, I know the Bible from Genesis to Revelation or from cover to cover. Every time you go back to it, you're going to see something different if you're honestly seeking God for direction and wisdom. And so as we look at the timeline, the development of the children of Israel from the time of Moses to the time of the judges to the time of the kings, which the people requested, but I won't go into that. Amen. They saw everybody else having kings. They wanted kings so they could be like everybody else. God had to customize the way in which he was communicating to the children or to creation during their different times. There are segments of times within biblical history where the people of God, God's creation, would not listen to God. And it became so pervasive that by the time we get to the end of the Old Testament and the prophecy of Malachi, God stops speaking. And there's an uh, intertestamental period between the Old Testament and the New Testament where God does not speak. And God turned off the volume, not because God stopped being God, but because we turned our hearing aids down to God and wanted to listen to ourselves more than we wanted to listen to God. Teach, pastor. Even though we had this history and all of these books of the law and history that tells us about the development of God and the interaction of God with his people, the people or the children of God got to a point where they would rather listen to little gods than the big one. I love to play golf, and I remember the first time I had a golf lesson from a professional golf instructor. And one of the things that he told me, he says, listen, you've got to concentrate on the little ball and not the big ball. Well, I couldn't get that, uh, Elder Bruce. I, I just I couldn't, I couldn't concept or conceive in my mind what he was talking about, the little ball and the big ball. So finally, I asked him, you keep talking about this little ball and the big ball, tell me. What's the little ball and the big ball? He says, well, the little ball is the golf ball. The big ball is the earth that you're standing on. And he says, you got to concentrate on the little ball that's on a tee on the big ball. Hello, somebody. See, I was having so many problems because I was hitting the big ball before I hit the little ball. And the little ball wasn't going anywhere because I was hitting the big ball first and the big ball was taking all my energy away. See, the problem with us is just the reverse. We're spending so much time looking and concentrating on the little ball, which is our lives, 
and not the big ball, which is God. I wish I had some help in here. Jesus put it this way in Matthew. He says, you blind guys, you strain the gnats and swallow camels. Ooh. See, the little things, the little things that you should not be paying attention to, that's what you're paying attention to, and you're missing the big things that God has said. Matter of fact, uh, Paul talks about the weightier matters, those things that really matter in life, the, the big picture, if you will. And the big picture of this is God has always been God, and God has always been trying to communicate God's will to his people. But we get caught up in our own will and our own way, and we miss what God is trying to say to us. Teach, pastor. I'm trying to do the best I can. Paul put it this way to the Romans. He says, listen, you being so excited about what's going on that you're being ignorant of God's righteousness, you've gone about to establish your own righteousness and have not submitted yourself to the righteousness of God. That's Romans chapter 10, for those of you who won't read it later on. We just concentrated just like the create the creatures of God back in the time of Babel, that they wanted to do their own thing and their own thoughts and their own minds, and so they said, let us build a tower to heaven in case another flood comes, we'll be safe, but at the same time, we want to build a tower unto ourselves. See, the problem, beloved, is looking at the little ball. We want to build these towers to ourselves and we miss what God is saying in the middle of all that's going on. The progression of this is that God has been trying to show and demonstrate unto us his will and his way for humanity, but we keep interfering and doing it our way. And so we move from Moses and the written word to the time of the prophets where we get God's spoken word through the prophets. But in each segment of those times, even when God was giving Moses the written law on the tablets, the people were down in the valley, had already created a golden calf that they had persuaded Aaron, the priest, to assist them in making this golden calf. Y'all got real quiet on me right there. I, that's a point I was trying to make. Amen, somebody. That they persuaded and pressured the preacher mm, to form this calf for them. And the reality of it is the calf was created from the gold, from their earrings and possession that God gave them or the reparations that they got when they left Egypt. And they took those and made a golden calf and then declared, this is the God that brought us out of Egypt. Even while God was giving them the written law, they were breaking all of the laws, particularly the first one. Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. Demonstrating their anti-love for the God that brought them out of bondage and was leading them into a land of promise. And so God had to readjust again. And as the people grew and leaders rose up, God put his anointing on individuals. King Saul became God's king for the people. And in the beginning, Saul was a good king. Hello, somebody. I said in the beginning. But power has a way. Not just in the Bible. Power and privilege has a way of perverting our sense of right and wrong. It perverts us where we move from God's way and God's will to our own way and our own will. We can see that right now down in Washington, D.C. In our state capitals, we see it. And even in our churches. People get titles and positions and they forget where they were and where God has brought them from. And soon King Saul got beyond himself and God had to remove his anointing up from him and then place his anointing on a little boy named David. Saul was so engrossed in who he was and his ability, he felt if he killed David, then the anointing would come back. Well, beloved, it doesn't work that way. Putting somebody else's candle out don't make yours shine any brighter. Hello, somebody. And as we look at this thing progressively, Saul wasn't the only one at a time, even though David was a man after God's own heart, David was human, just like us all. And David faltered. 
And his son Solomon came up. And Solomon was a good king. And he was able to build the, the temple and the palaces for God. But after a while, Solomon fell and fell to, to, mm, to the influences of his various wives. And over time, he moved from worshiping God and tried to split the difference and worship the big God and also all of the little ones. And after a while, that failed. But during all of those times, God was still trying to communicate God's will to his people. And he raised up these prophets that became known as men of God that were sharing God's word to the people for the times that they were in. The prophet Elijah, the prophet Isaiah, prophet Ezekiel, during all of these times, these prophets were saying to the children of God, listen to what God is saying to you in these last and evil days. Some of them listened. Some of them even asked the question, is there any word from the Lord in the midst of all of this? Because it seemed like God had stopped talking. And maybe in our little minute time on this big ball that it had seemed like God had stopped talking to us as well. But I'm here to tell you, God never stopped talking. That even when the children of Israel failed to listen to the prophets and the priests, God was still trying to communicate with them. God was still presenting God's self in many signs and wonders. I mean, just think for a second. How can you deny or even... Uh, fall back from worshiping God that when you were in the desert that God shielded you with a cloud during the heat of the day and at night as the temperature went down and it got cold God presented God's self as a pillar of fire that kept you warm in the cold nights of the desert how can you deny God when God gave you manna from heaven that was just what you needed for the day you couldn't even save any or refrigerate it or freeze it or, or put it in your air vacuum sealer for the next day because God says what I had for you today ain't gonna work for you tomorrow oh I wish I had some help he's got new mercies and new blessings for you each and every Every day because God recognizes that if I make it to tomorrow I'm not going to be the same person tomorrow that I am today that I'm going to learn something from today that's going to go in my storehouse and make me a different and hopefully better person tomorrow so there's this progressiveness of God's communication to his creation it was verbal it was written then it became verbal again through his ambassadors, through God's prophets. But at the end of the prophetic period, God stopped talking. And the record shows for us that after Malachi and Matthew, that there was this intertestamental period, this, this maximum of 40 to 400 years where God was not talking. Or at least we were not listening. Or at least there was no record of God's communication to us, at least not in our King James version of the Bible. There is a version of the Bible, the Greek uh, Old Testament called the Septuagint, that gives us some ancillary books and writings that lets us know of some things that were happening. But those books happened at a time when people had lost sight of God and was not listening to God. And God had to regroup, not to say that God had, had made a mistake or God didn't know what was going to happen. But the New Testament introduces itself with God saying, I'm doing this thing a new way. John chapter 1 takes us back and connects us with Genesis chapter 1. It says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. Watch this, and the word was God. Unlike some translations that say, and the word was a God. No, the word was God. 
And the same that was in the beginning with God, all things came into being through him and apart from him, nothing came into being that came into being. It was in him that we have life and that life was the light unto men. See, when God opens up this New Testament or this new dispensation under his only begotten son, Jesus, there's a direct connection to the very beginning to show the continuity and the consistency of God's interaction with humanity. But the New Testament gives us a different perspective. It is not one where God is detached from his creation. Hello, somebody. See, in the beginning, God spoke and stuff appeared somewhere else. In the Old Testament, he wrote it on the word and he presented it to the people. There were no direct connection internally to the word of God and the people of God. But when we get to the New Testament, there is a different version that is presented to us. And before we get there, you need to understand that as the writers of the New Testament record what was happening they were not walking around with secretaries and stenographers they were not walking around with notebooks and recorders and iPads and laptops. Y'all don't hear me in here. They did not have cassette recorders or video recorders to record what was happening when it happened. What actually happened was after the events had took place, they were now able in retrospect to sit down and reflect on the things that were that had happened and record what took place. The New Testament book is interesting because the New Testament is the perspectives of individuals and what they went through from their individual cultures and their individual perspectives. The Gospels are written from individuals that came from different cultures and different backgrounds and they wrote from those backgrounds but they had an intended audience that they were writing to. If you spend some time looking at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you the first thing that you will understand is that the audiences were specific. Matthew and Mark had a Jewish audience in mind. Y'all don't hear me in here. Luke and John had a different perspective. Luke was writing to the Gentiles about the same Jesus that Mark and Matthew and Mark wrote about. And then John wrote a whole different perspective. It's not who he was talking to or his intended audience. He was trying to present the perspective from God. He was not trying to connect the lineage of Jesus to humanity. He was trying to and did in a very special way the lineage of Jesus to his father. Y'all don't hear me in here because that's the crux of the gospel and the good news that God commended his love for us by sending his only begotten son, Jesus, to be the illustrated version of God's love in the world. See, Jesus was not just the word around us. Jesus was the word with us. Y'all don't hear me in here. And last Sunday, I shared with you the text that when Jesus was to be conceived, that God told through the angel told Mary to name him Jesus, or should I say Emmanuel, meaning God with us. In other words, God is not somewhere sitting, looking down and passing judgment on us, but God is with us. God is with us in our homes. God is with us in our bedrooms. God is with us in our cars. God is with us in the sanctuary. God is with us in the basement. God is with us in the streets. God is with us as we interact with one another. God God is with us. Now that changes the perspective of humanity when we understand and realize that God is with us. And so as we deal with this illustrated version, we see the vividness of God's love and God's person manifested in our place, in our time, in our culture. Hello, somebody. You, you've got to really get this and understand that the illustrated version in John chapter 1 verse 14, it says, and the word became flesh. That, that's point number one, is that the word or God became tangible. Well, what do I mean tangible? I don't mean subject to decay and rot. What I mean, Deacon Billings, is God is touchable. Mm. Who wouldn't have a God that we couldn't feel, 
sometime. Is there anybody in here that says, I worship a God that I can feel, a God that I can touch, a God that I can interact with? I understand that God is a spirit and we can't see him. We can't put our, 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 our physical hands on him. But if I understand the spirit, I understand that wherever the spirit of the Lord is, and that is everywhere, there is liberty. And although I can't tangibly touch God, God is here. God is in this post. God is in that chair. God is in the lights. God is in the air. God is in your smile. God is even in your frown. God is in us. And because he's in us, God is everywhere. Therefore, I can feel God. I can interact with God. God is something. God is somebody. God is an energy. God is a spirit. And those that worship God must worship God in spirit and in truth. And when I begin to worship God in the fullness that God is I express it in the only way I can in the clapping of my hands and the stomping of my feet and the opening up of my mouth and the jumping of my body it shows up in my physical person because my spirit connects with his spirit because his spirit is my spirit and when you see me you ought to be able to see God God is not invisible. God is tangible. According to Webster, tangible means capable of being perceived, especially by the sense of touch. Now understand, with humanity and our human being, as humans, we have five senses. Amen? We can see we can hear, we can taste, we can touch. Hello, there's one more. We can smell. Hello, somebody. If, if you go back to the Old Testament, when God would fill the temple, in, in Chronicles, Second Chronicles, when the Spirit of God filled the temple, it appeared like a fog. Y'all don't hear me here. They saw the fog. And the fog was so thick that it Push the priest out of the temple. That meant they could feel him. Y'all don't hear me in here somewhere. I dare you. I dare you to go through your senses when you wake up in the morning. Ask yourself, can I see God? Ask yourself, can I smell the presence of God? Ask yourself, can I hear God? Ask yourself, can I taste God? Ask yourself, can I feel him? Well, while you're going through all of those, let me just tell you what I saw, what I smelled, what I heard, what I felt early this this morning when I woke up and opened my eyes I saw the light that God created and then I heard the birds sing y'all don't hear me in here I heard the birds singing outside when I got up and I was able to move around I could feel God moving all over me and when I opened up the door Deacon Bill as there was a breeze blowing I could feel God y'all don't hear me in here then I got me a little snack this morning uh, sister Jones and I could taste the presence of God, I dare you to feel this tangible God that is in our midst. The illustrated version is a tangible God, but not only is he a tangible God, he's a livable God. The second part of verse 14 says, and he dwelt among us. When Jesus came and lived and walked for some 33 years on the earth, he ate with his family and later on his disciples. They slept in the same space. They experienced the same conditions. He felt the same disappointment. Hello, somebody. He felt grief when Lazarus died. Any of y'all been on that street? <laughs> any of you been on Hungry Street? Any of you been on uh, Hallelujah, a street where you didn't have all that you needed? Jesus lived, Jesus dwelt in the midst of his people and Jesus was able to understand everything his children and his people were going through. When the disciples were out on the boat and they were in the midst of the storm, one account said Jesus was in the hinder part of the boat sleep. Let me just pause for a second and ask, is there anybody in here that can sleep? 
in the midst of a storm, oh, there's a sermon right there. If you if you know this illustrated God, this illustrated version, then you're able to sleep during some storms in your life. I'm a human just like you, and I understand that there's some storms that it's just hard to sleep through. That human reality gets and takes over, and your mind goes away. And yeah, you know that there's a supreme God that's not going to put anything more on you than you can bear. There's this understanding that God is a healer of all manner of sickness and disease but every time you look at that doctor's prognosis and it doesn't look good, it doesn't look like you're going to make it out of here you get like Mary and Martha when their brother Lazarus died Lord if you'd only show up a few minutes earlier we wouldn't be in this condition but when you know God and you have a relationship with God you can say even in the midst of a dying and dead situation God can bring bring stuff back to life uh, but God needed to let us know uh, that I know how you feel uh, I stand before families who have lost loved ones uh, and one of the things that I try not to do uh, is to say I know how you feel uh, but I can tell you I know somebody uh, who knows how you feel uh, I know somebody uh, that's been where you've been uh, I know somebody uh, who have cried the tears you've cried uh, and his name is Jesus. His name is wonderful. His name is counselor. His name is prince of peace and mighty God. He is a livable God because when I wake up, he's with me. When I go through my day, God is with me. When I eat, God's right there at the table. That's why before I put a bite in my mouth, I tell God, thank you for the food that's on my table every time I go out the door and get him a little buggy I tell God thank you for providing this buggy and the money to pay the note y'all don't hear me in here we serve and we're in relationship with a livable God not only is this illustrated version tangible not only is he livable but lastly, he's visible. Y'all don't hear me. And the word became flesh and dwelt among me. And we saw. I said we saw. His glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the father. Full of grace and truth. In Exodus, Moses was able to see the backside of God's glory. The prophet Isaiah that declared in the year King Uzziah died, I also saw the Lord high and lifted up in his temple. Everybody else encountered God through God's voice as God spoke to him. And I know we're some 2,000 years past the death and the presence of Jesus walking on the earth. And we did not have an eyewitness account from our own perspective of this man named Jesus. But we do have a written record from those who eyewitnessed the life of Jesus. And you can take it for what you want to and for what it's worth for you. But my Bible tells me that not only, not only beloved, do I have all of these various versions of the Bible. The English Standard Version, the King James Version, the American Standard Version, the International Version, the New King James Version, y'all don't hear me in here, the New Living Translation, the New Revised Standard, as if the Revised wasn't enough, we revised the Revision. The revised English version. Going on back, we have the Tyndale and the revised version. We have all of these different versions of the same account. But what we miss a lot of times, Sister Jones, is the revisions or the translations that we have have not been translated from the original text. That most of our translations are translations of translations. Y'all don't hear me in here. I learned something when I was in college we were doing something uh, called recorded media, and back then we were using the, these big reel-to-reels. I know young folk don't know what I'm talking about. 
We're using these reel to reels with tapes, and we were able to splice tapes. So we could take the tape, spread it out, cut a piece of it off, and attach another piece on there, and put it together, and we would make a whole different type. Now we can do that with computers. Yeah, they can take an image of you, Sister Jones, and put somebody else's face on your body. Boy, if life was only that easy. I cut some pieces out in here and put some other pieces in and cut some pieces off in here and put some other pieces in there and look a whole lot better, but it don't work like that. The longer you're around here, life is going to show up all over you. We had all of these different versions and we've gotten all of these different versions since the printing of the Bible began. And since the printing of the Bible began was well after the death of Jesus Christ. But I'm so glad that the record that we have is not all those different versions, but we have the illustrated version. Oh, not the sports illustrated version, not time life's version of Jesus, but we have the life and times of Jesus and from Peter to Paul and all of the bishops and the disciples and the apostles after him they recorded what they saw for themselves it was the women who left that tomb uh, on the day that Jesus was raised uh, they went back and they told the disciples uh, we have seen the Lord uh, and he is not dead uh, we've seen the Lord and he's alive uh, those two disciples on the road to Emmaus was walking with Jesus and Jesus was talking to them and they did didn't recognize him because they were not privy to uh, the illustrated version. Uh, Y'all don't hear me. The illustrated version is more vivid. The, in, the, the visual version or the illustrated version is more interactive. And, and when you interact with Jesus, you will come away different than you were when you went in. Uh, I just need to know this morning, is there anybody here um, that has been exposed uh, to the illustrated version? Uh, oh, don't get me wrong. The illustrated version is the vocal version. The illustrated version is the written version. But the illustrated version is the life version of Jesus Christ who understands my pain and my struggle. The illustrated version of Jesus is the one that understands my complexities and my maladies of life. The illustrated version like a close-up picture it shows your pimples it shows your blemishes it shows your imperfections but it also shows your healing and your deliverance it shows that although you've been exposed to sin you can also be exposed to the grace and mercy of God through his son Jesus Christ as I go to my seat my Bible tells me that while I was messed up while I was tore up from the flow up uh, while I was in my sin. Uh, God commended uh, God's love towards me uh, in sending uh, the illustrated version. Uh, and the illustrated version was not just the letter of the law uh, that told me what not to do. Uh, but the illustrated version was the spirit of the law that shows me why I ought to love my brother and my sister. The illustrated version shows me how how I ought to express and demonstrate that love in these last and evil days. Come on in here with me. Is there anybody here this morning that has been exposed to the illustrated version? I'm here to tell you if you expose to the illustrated version, there is a change that will happen in your life. I told this story some time ago and I learned something about some of our members. I had the experience of taking a photography class. And this was when the time of photography used film and not digital technology. Y'all don't hear me? Those of you who can go back that far understands that when you took pictures with the old Kodaks, I ain't talking about the instant ones. I'm talking about the old Kodaks. That when you got to the end of the roll. You had to wind the roll up before you took it out of the camera. Then you had to take it to a photographer who would develop your film. What I like about it was 
the whole process was created and directed and controlled by light. Y'all don't hear me in here. When you got ready to take the picture and you push the button, a shutter would open and allow light to enter the film and the light would project the image on the outside of the camera. If you had too much exposure, your picture would be whited out. If you didn't have enough light, you would get a dark picture. Y'all don't hear me in here. I'm going to close this thing in a minute. But if you had the right proper light, you got the right picture. But you couldn't see the picture. You had to take the film and have the photographer, watch this, develop the negative. Mm -hmm. See, y'all thought I was going to say develop the picture. No, you can't get the picture until you develop the negative. Y'all don't hear me in here. I'm going to give you a new perspective about negative things that happen in your life. Without a negative, you can't have a positive. If you don't have a negative, you can't have a picture. I dare you this morning to get up and shout on your negative situation, on your fault and your failure because it's from the negative that the photographer takes and dips it in solution in the dark room. Y'all don't hear me in here. And that negative would then transfer the positive to the picture paper. I dare you. I dare you. Just take a look at yourself. Take a look at somebody standing and sitting next to you. You're looking at a negative. See, y'all don't get it. You're looking at a negative. Why are you looking at a negative? Because my Bible says it does not yet appear what you shall be like. But when you expose to the light, well, who or what is the light? Jesus is the light of the world. And Jesus knows just how much to shine in your life, to turn your negative into a positive. Is there anybody here that can shout today? I have seen, I know from myself the illustrated. The illustrated, the illustrated version. If you want to see, just look at me. Glory, hallelujah. Let's give the Lord some praise. Let's give him some glory. Hallelujah. The illustrated version. Let the church stand at this time. There may be somebody within the sanctuary that do not know the illustrated version. There may be somebody live streaming that may not know the illustrated version. There may be somebody here this morning that can't sing that song that we used to sing. I can feel them in my hands. I can feel them in my feet. I can feel them all over me. This is your opportunity. Yes. God's not dead. He's yet alive. Feel him in my hands. Feel him in my feet. Feel him all over me. Is there one this morning? Hallelujah! As 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 we who know the Lord. We can give him glory. We can give him honor. We can feel his very presence. But there may be somebody that doesn't feel it. Maybe there's somebody who has not received Jesus as Lord and Savior of their lives. The opportunity is now. Come, harden not your hearts, but come while you hear. For faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And the word of God went forth just now. Hallelujah. 
Oh, it did. Is there one? Is there one? Is there one? Live streaming. Let us know. If you've received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we'll get in contact with you. You could come as a candidate for baptism. You could come with your Christian experience or by letter. Oh, just come. I thank you, Lord. You brought me a mighty long way. Mighty long way. Is there one? I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Lord. You brought me. A mighty, well, if you re if you know the Lord God, if you know the illustrated version, if you are a child of the King, let's give Him some glory. Let's give Him some honor. Let's give him some praise. Hallelujah. Glory. Glory to God. I don't want you to sit down because we're going to prepare for our benediction and offering. If the deacons will come forth to move the offering tables. We know the, the sequence here. Uh, sections A and section C will come first. Section B to follow. So as we're preparing our hearts, we can continue to praise our Lord God. We can continue the illustrated version. Let us bow our heads for the offering. Lord God, we thank you that we are able to give. We give out of your own hand what you have first given to us, Lord. We give you that portion back that you require of us. And we come, Lord, gladly giving because, Lord God, you so graciously gave us first. So, Lord, thank you for the tithes, the offerings, Lord God, the the benevolence, Lord God, we know that you'll take it and you'll accomplish what you will have to be accomplished with it. This we pray in Jesus' name. Now, let's lift up our hands. Now, the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Let the church say, Amen. 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 Amen.